Welcome into Duval Daily, presented by GenJag.com. I'm Jordan DeLugo. Thanks so much for tuning in here on Monday, February 26th. It is Combine Week, big week for the NFL draft process. This is a piece to the puzzle, right? It's not the entire evaluation. Yes, you've got guys running 40-yard dashes, doing the vertical, all sorts of testing, all sorts of on-field work. But this is just one piece to the puzzle in the NFL draft. But it is a big piece because it can confirm what you've seen on tape from a guy with their speed, explosiveness, quickness, et cetera, agility. Or it can kind of put questions in your mind like, I expected this guy to be running in the four fives and he ran a four three or uh, vice versa, different things like that. So it's kind of something that can help you uh, confirm or, or go back and figure out why you didn't see this type of athleticism on tape. So that's what it's going to be for a lot of these scouts and general managers uh, looking at these guys. But today we are going to preview the wide receiver position. Uh, we're doing wide receivers individually because there are loads of, of wide receivers in this draft class. And the Jaguars, it's going to be a really interesting position for them um, in the coming weeks to see kind of where things go with this receiver position. We'll also do offensive line because, again, a lot of quality prospects. And the Jaguars, they could have a ton of flux at offensive line, at wide receiver. Uh, But, yeah, these are the two areas on offense where I just think that there could be a lot of change this offseason for the Jacksonville Jaguars, and there's plenty of good prospects for them to potentially target. You know, looking at wide receiver Calvin Ridley's future, it's murky right now. We don't know what's going to happen, right? The Jaguars, they're believed to uh, probably going to tag Josh Allen. Uh, Calvin Ridley, they don't want to get a deal done prior to the new league year because then they have to give up a second round pick to the Falcons. Uh, If they wait till after the new league year, though, you potentially run the risk of him exiting out the door and going somewhere else. And then you're giving up a third round pick and not retaining Calvin Ridley. You know, Zay Jones, he could be a cap casualty. Jamal Agnew is a free agent. So yeah, there's a lot of, of uh, questions surrounding this Jaguars wide receiver room. The only players we know are going to be there. Christian Kirk, who is your slot star, your, your most reliable weapon, uh, probably Parker Washington as well. You know, who was a, a late round pick last year has, more of a slot receiver skill set than an outside receiver skill set, but he can help you out in year two. Obviously, Evan Ingram at tight end is going to be a primary pass catcher, but uh, if there's no Ridley, no Jones, no Agnew, or some combination of those guys not returning to the Jaguars, that's a lot of targets exiting the door, You know, leaving this offense. A lot of targets to be filled either in free agency or in the draft, and we're going to dive into... A lot of these draftable guys, what they could look like at the Combine, what they need to do here uh, for the Jacksonville Jaguars. But if you enjoy the content, please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. You can also check out ginjag.com slash shop, pick up some new Duval gear. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of talented receivers in this draft class that the Jaguars should potentially be looking to capitalize on, not just for 2024 production, but long-term, making sure you have a stable of receivers that that Trevor Lawrence can rely on, and eventually you're not going to be wanting to pay all these free agent deals. You need to land some receivers. Now the catch there is um, Trent Baalke has never drafted a starting receiver, right? A.J. Jenkins is the only receiver he's drafted in the first round, really on the first two days of the draft. He's the only receiver Trent Baalke has taken in the first three rounds of the NFL draft as a general manager. And again, Balky's never really hit on a receiver. Right now, Parker Washington might already be the most proven receiver that Trent Balky has ever drafted. I mean, he's only been in the league one year and, you know, wasn't even called upon to do that much. And there was a few instances where uh, he wasn't quite ready for the situation. So uh, Jaguars have potential work to do. We're going to see how Trent Balky handles this. Unless they spend big in free agency, it's probably going to be one of their top needs entering the draft. I strongly believe, looking at this class, at the very least, Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunze, and Malik Neighbors are going to be long gone before the Jaguars pick at 17. Maybe Odunze or Neighbors would be in striking distance for a trade-up, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend trading up, even though I love both of those prospects, just because you have a lot of needs. I don't think you want to just kind of you know, throw away this draft when you already have a, a third round pick potentially exiting most likely a third round pick with the Calvin Ridley situation. Um, do you really want to give up more draft capital to move up for another receiver? I don't think so, but uh, would I knock them if Odunze or neighbors kind of fell into a range where they felt comfortable not giving up too, too much 
and moving up for one of them. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against that at all. Cause I think they're special, but again, you're starting to invest a lot of those picks in, in just one position. Um, also, you know, if, if Brock Bowers, who is going to be a pass catcher falls, uh, I would be in on that as well, potentially, but looking at what the Jaguars could, could be interested in if they want to go receiver at 17, which again, not a common route for Trent Walking in the NFL draft, but I think he would be all over Brian Thomas Jr. And we've talked about that. This is a guy that has an unbelievable combination of athletic traits and size. You know, six foot four, two oh five. He's probably going to run in the four threes. He's very quick. He kind of glides out there on the football field. Came down with a lot of contested catches last year. Led the nation in touchdown receptions. Uh, I do believe that from from a uh, hands standpoint, they could be more consistent. I also think that he could play with more consistent effort. And he's a guy that even though he did come down with a lot of contested catches, I kind of think that was more about Jaden Daniels putting the ball on him than it really was about him being um, a, a, a tremendous hands catcher. I think he needs to do a better job attacking the football in the air. But again, when you can jump the way he can jump, when you can run the way he can run, and you have that type of size, yeah, it's going to make things a little bit easier for you. You don't necessarily have to be the uh, most prolific hands catcher in the world. You don't necessarily have to attack the football. If you've got a guy that's going to put it on you and you have the length, the catch radius uh, to go get it, right? So I think Brian Thomas Jr. is the type of player the Jaguars would love. I think Keon Coleman is the type of player Trent Baalke would love as well. Uh, I mentioned that that Brian Thomas Jr. isn't a super consistent effort guy, doesn't play with as much physicality as you would expect for a receiver above 200 pounds. Keon Coleman plays with all that 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 physicality. He is so over-criticized, in my opinion, coming off a season where he played through injury. This guy's 20 years old, about to turn 21. He is twitched up, best hands in the class, bar none, in my opinion. I think he's going to put on a show, too. I think he can jump really high. I think he's going to run faster than people expect, fully healthy, and really look more like the guy you saw at the very beginning of the 2023 season and the player you saw at Michigan State. I know if you go back and watch that tape at Michigan State, he looked fantastic. And again, early on at FSU. So I think those are the top two potential guys they could get at 17. Uh, I'm not sure if any of these other prospects, besides the first three we talked about, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze, would really be uh, – on their board at 17. I think that potentially in a trade down from 17, there are some prospects that start to make sense for them. One of them is Troy Franklin out of Oregon, blazing speed. He's six foot three. He is light. He's about 190 pounds, but advanced release packages, great length, very good route runner, a guy that is going to take the top off the defense. I think he can be a three level threat. I think you want to see the hands a little bit more consistent. Um, they've been up and down, but he can definitely pluck the ball out of the air. He can separate anywhere you want. And again, he can re release off the line so he can play outside for you um, and be a guy that I think Trevor Lawrence can really rely on. Adonai Mitchell, I have him higher than than everyone we've talked about so far um, in terms of the trade down stuff. Uh, I, I think that I have him higher than Brian Thomas Jr. I have Keon Coleman higher than Brian Thomas Jr. as well, just because I think there's a lot of variance in what Brian Thomas Jr. can bring to the field. Uh, I think there's some boom bust to a Brian Thomas Jr. But Adonai Mitchell, um, hands, release package, route running, separation, length, size. I think he's a, a tremendous athlete in terms of his ability to uh, hang up in the air and go get the football. I think that he's going to run fast. I love Adonai Mitchell. I don't think there's any major hole in his game. And even though he's uh, you know six foot four, like Brian Thomas Jr. listed below two hundred pounds, I think he plays the game more physically than Brian Thomas Jr. does, who who has a good bit of uh, mass on him. So I think he's got that wiry strength, and he really brings the effort more consistently. I love Adonai Mitchell. So all these guys that we've talked about so far, they have great length. Now in the second round, there are some prospects. I don't think Balky will be in on because they're smaller, but we really just don't know. You know, again, AJ Jenkins was not the biggest guy in the world. He was six foot, you know, a little above 200 pounds. So maybe, maybe size at the wide receiver position isn't like a prerequisite for Trent Balky, like it is in some other spots that we know about that he's drafted more. Uh, but looking at the Jaguars second round pick and beyond, you know, 48 overall and after. 
There are a ton of prospects that could make sense for them. We're going to dive into a bunch of these guys right now. Again, some of these guys are a little smaller. Roman Wilson is one of them. I have a first-round grade, though, on Roman Wilson. He's not the biggest dude, but he can absolutely fly. He's going to um, run in the four threes, I believe. Uh, according to the freaks list, he was able to run in the four threes last summer. He also uh, did short shuttles and three cone times last summer. That would be in the 99th percentile at wide receiver. So you're talking about someone who can run as fast as anyone on the planet, basically, but also stop on a dime, have that quickness, have that agility. Um, and he's tough as nails. He catches everything. If he was in a different offense than Michigan, which was obviously a run first offense, I think he, he could have put up insane numbers at the college level. Super quick and twitchy route runner, uh, strong hands. He's strong pound for pound, right? Again, a guy that brings intensity, even though he's not super big. And he put on a show at the Senior Bowl. He's probably going to be a Z slash slot receiver, which several of the guys we're going to talk about here fit more into that mold than like a true X. Uh, but a guy who I think could be an X receiver, Jalen Polk, I have a second round grade on him, early second. I think he's going to be super explosive here at the Combine. Good size, strong hands, just a super balanced overall athlete and prospect at the wide receiver position. I don't know if he's ever going to be like a true number one, but I think he could be a, a, a second option in a passing attack. And again, with what the Jaguars have already, they have some chain movers in, in Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram. Getting a Jalen Polk could make sense. I also think... Even though, don't know size-wise if Trent Baalke will be in on it. Lad McConkey could absolutely make sense. Probably the best route runner from a technical standpoint in this class, not named Marvin Harrison Jr. Kind of similar to Roman Wilson and the size aspect of it. Probably a Z slash slot receiver, not really an X. But he can separate at all three levels of the field. Love Lad McConkey's game. Malik Washington out of Virginia, one of my guys, a running back once he gets the ball in his hands, but he's very fast and shifty, good route runner, great hands. He's my top candidate for a shorter receiver to kind of break out in year one in the NFL, similar to what Tank Dell did last year. Not the same type of receiver as Tank Dell, but I think that Malik Washington could absolutely break out despite being uh, on the diminutive side at wide receiver in year one. Malachi Corley, uh, I love his game. You want to keep running screens all day if that's what they want to do again next year, which I hope that's not the case. But Jaguars led the NFL in screens. If you want to keep doing that, Malachi Corley is your guy. He can actually start doing some things on those screens, helping the Jaguars pick up yardage on those screens. He can do more than that, though. Uh, showed the ability to run routes at the Senior Bowl. At Western Kentucky, was not asked to run the full route tree was very limited in what he was doing, and I don't think that's because he can't do it. I think that's just because that's what their offense called for. But he can sink his hips. He can change directions. Uh, I think that Malachi Corley, the, the arrow is pointing up on his development. I think he can line up anywhere, but probably primarily a slot early on just due to that's what where he lined up um, at Western Kentucky. You're going to have to try to fast track him to get him ready to play outside if that's what you want to do. Uh, Javon Baker out of UCF. Still super underrated, in my opinion. I think he's going to test explosively. I don't know if he's going to run the fastest, so that's going to be interesting to see where that works out for Javon Baker. But a guy who can go up and get the football in contested catch situations has the ability to uh, change directions and, and create separation at all three levels very quickly. So I think he's a guy at six foot one, 208, that has just a very balanced overall game, kind of similar to Jalen Polk in that regard. Should be a second-round pick, but maybe... Uh, hangs around a little bit longer because, again, this is such a deep receiver class, and there's some other spots in this class that are very deep as well, offensive tackle, interior offensive line, um, where maybe some of these guys that should be off the board are available to you later on. Ricky Pearsall is another candidate potentially in that regard. Another Z slash slot receiver type of guy. But uh, Roman Wilson and Lad McConkey, those two are a little shorter. Than, than a Ricky Pearsall. Ricky Pearsall has some length to him, has the ability to really go up and get the football. Very good athlete, very good hands, technical route runner. Uh, like I said, a little more size and length than Roman Wilson or Lad McConkey. Probably not quite the same top speed as those two. I think Roman Wilson will be the fastest, then Lad McConkey, then Ricky Pearsall. But I think Pearsall will jump out of the gym. He's a very good athlete, very explosive. Uh, Xavier Worthy, a speed demon 
absolute burner. Uh, never going to have the most natural hands, unfortunately. Always going to be very, very small. I think he's under 170 pounds. But he has special vertical speed, can throttle and separate. He is going to fly out there, run in the four threes. Should be a primary vertical threat at the next level. I've seen some comparisons to Jamison Williams. I think Williams was a much better prospect coming out. I think he had more reliable hands. But I understand where people are going with that a little bit. Xavier Leggett is an absolute wild card. What is he going to do out there? Uh, set the mark in 2023, college or professional, for the fastest ball carrier on the planet. So you know this guy has burners. He's you know over 220 pounds, over 6 feet 1, uh, has very good verticality to his game, can high point the football, but he just hasn't been the most consistent, didn't break out until he was 23 years old at South Carolina. So a lot of question marks surrounding Xavier Leggett. We'll see how he performs. Devontae Walker, in my opinion, out of North Carolina, he needs to have a big day as well. Disappointed at the Senior Bowl because he was just dropping the football, plain and simple. Could not hold on to the ball, and that wasn't really re- reflected on his tape. So it's going to be interesting to see how he looks going through the receiver drills out there. I think he can run really fast. The way he uh, runs his routes, the way he's a little bit leggy, Kind of reminds me of a Brandon Ayuk, a Dontavion Wicks, guys like that. So I think that if De- Devontae Walker can run fast, which I believe he will, um, and show that his hands are more natural than he showed at the Senior Bowl, you know, more more so what you saw on tape from him in college, then this is a guy that can. Um, I don't think there were people saying he was a first round pick. I didn't ever see that. But I do think he can solidify himself as like potentially a late second, early third round type of guy with a good day out there. Anthony Gold from Oregon State, very small, small receiver, but an absolute dynamo, a very good route runner, has a nice release package, um, can, can just sh- shift unbelievably. Like he he kind of looks like a video game out there, the way he is able to uh, make you know slippery little cuts and just kind of put guys in a blender to me, he is the second best short receiver, a guy you know behind Malik Washington that maybe can can blow up in year one. Jaquan Jackson is right there as well in terms of these short guys. He's got some density to him as though uh, you know some mass on his frame, but he can separate all over the field out of two lane. I think he's going to be fun to watch. Jalen McMillan, kind of a forgotten guy from Washington, third receiver, dealt with some injuries this year, really was the second receiver prior to 2023, but Jalen Polk was able to kind of steal the show in that regard. I want to see how he tests, but I think he can be a productive slot slash G receiver in the NFL. Brendan Rice, you know, Jerry Rice's son, I think he needs a big day. I did not love the tape, didn't really love the senior bowl tape either. I think that... um A guy who, he's bigger, right? He's over 200 pounds. He's over six foot two. But uh, what does he really bring to the field in terms of his athleticism? I'm excited to see that. Definitely going to be intriguing. And then another uh, NFL legacy guy, Luke McCaffrey, son of Ed, brother of Christian. He might have the best combination of traits um, in terms of these lower tier receivers because he's six foot two, over 200 pounds. He runs fast. Uh, he comes down with a lot of contested catches. Didn't start playing wide receiver until a couple years ago. This is the type of guy that I think a, a Trent Balky could potentially like a lot because he has the size, he has the athleticism as long as he goes out there and tests well. Um, and he, he performed well at the Senior Bowl. Tough as nails, too. So we'll see about that. A uh, lot of guys we've talked about here, right, at wide receiver. And there's even more that we haven't touched on, but uh, just for the sake of uh, the length of this episode here, we're going to go ahead and shut it down in terms of talking about more prospect prospects. Excuse me, But I think if the Jaguars do end up needing a receiver, which we still don't know, Calvin Ridley, Zay Jones, do they bring back Jamal Agnew? It doesn't seem like it. Uh, I do think that, that, that they're going to be looking for primarily an outside guy if they do need a receiver. I think that's going to be how it shapes up. And so I think that Trent Baalke will be looking for length catch radius, speed, overall athleticism. And I think that Brian Thomas Jr., Keon Coleman, Troy Franklin, Adonai Mitchell, Jalen Polk, and Javon Baker maybe might fit that mold. I think Xavier Leggett, like I mentioned, an older prospect, late breakout, but he has the size, the vertical speed, the explosiveness. Devontae Walker could fit that bill as well. Maybe Brendan Rice, maybe Luke McCaffrey. A lot of options for the Jaguars. And in a class like this with so many good receivers, I wouldn't blame them for going back to the well twice at the receiver position just because you need to, again, make sure that you have the weapons 
for Trevor Lawrence long term. Start really building a stable. You like what you got in Parker Washington last year. You like what you got in Elijah Cooks last year as well. A guy that didn't really get opportunities in year one, but throughout training camp and the preseason showed that he belongs in the NFL. I think with a big offseason, Elijah Cooks could become more of a factor for the Jaguars potentially. But so many options for the Jaguars here, both in terms of bringing back Calvin Ridley, Zay Jones, other free agent options, and then what comes in the draft after that, we will start finding out what the Jaguars' needs will be at the receiver position and throughout the rest of the roster over the next couple weeks. Really appreciate y'all tuning in. If you enjoy the content, please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. You can also check out ginjag.com shop, pick up some new Duval gear. Y'all have a good one.